Hello and welcome to the Heads and Volleys podcast with me, Lee Dunn. In this episode, my guest is Ben Bell. And if you don't know Ben, he is a master's student in the UK and has also recently released a book. And the book is titled Constraints Led Approach and Application in Football. And the reason for this book review and conversation with Ben is to really bring to you the understanding on the application of constraints. So enjoy listening to Ben. Yeah, thank you for having me. Very kind. Yeah, absolutely, mate. So uh, give us a little overview of who you are, where you're from, kind of what you do and, and the pathway of, of soccer or coaching football world that, you, that you're in. Cool. So, yeah, so I was born in Cardiff and I still live in Cardiff in Wales in the UK. My coaching career, I suppose, sort of started when I was in sixth form, just getting involved in running like football club sort of after school sort of activities and that which was great fun, built some really good relationships there. You know, it was quite weird because when I started as coaching boys, you were like years seven, eight or nine. And now some of them have just gone off to uni. <laughs> so, it's, so it's quite nice to have some of them sort of stayed in touch with. And it's quite nice to see them sort of go all the way through. But yeah, so I've got, I've got a BSc in sports coaching and I'm currently studying for an MSc in sports leadership with like the University of Gloucestershire and my sort of research topic is sort of around sort of coaching behaviours and coach-athlete relationships and around that sort of area and I started coaching when I was in university while doing like doing the football qualifications with the FA and the FAW and I now coach an under-15 team in in Cardiff which is the local grassroots team which is great fun. And so Get in, I mean, even if you start coaching when you're in sixth form, you're coaching kids who are 14, 15, 16 years old. They're only a couple of years younger than you, right? Yeah, it was really weird because I think that sort of really helped me, to be honest, because I didn't know anything about sort of coaching in terms of improving player performance or anything like that. The only thing I had to go on was actually, luckily, the people I was coaching with initially liked me. And I think... <laughs> So, and I, I can imagine like, if they didn't like me, I'd have nothing to fall back on because I couldn't coach. It was basically like, let's just play football. I know you want to play football. I'll join in because I want to play football as well. And then if you just sort of gradually build relationships from there, you know, and you get to know people, which is great. And yeah, it was, it was a bit weird because I was only 17 at the time and some of them were like three years younger than me. So there was a hell of a lot of like relatedness there. And I think it really helped because it gave the younger ones someone they knew in the school who was older, which they quite liked. You know, they would see me walking around, they'd ask me about football training and about stuff that's going on, and they thought it was quite fun. And I always sort of played into the fact that I wasn't a teacher. So I had that sort of little bit in between where I could relate to what they're going on, what they're going on about, what they're going through, and stuff like that. And I think that sort of stuck with me quite a lot because I still do it now, coaching boys of that age where I can sort of try to sort of just relate to them as much as I can and almost play up that sort of role as you know I'm not I'm not old enough to be your dad or your teacher <laughs> I, I'm a, you know I sort of try to get them a little bit more and sort of build that relationship a bit more. So would you say that is what led you kind of down the MSC route and looking at the relationship and the whole leadership aspect as opposed to I guess some people will probably try and go into the science of actually coaching and, and player mm -hmm. development and focusing on that route. So would you say that's kind of led you down this way more so from that experience? I think for sure, yeah. I think, it's, I mean, it sounds, sounds slightly hypocritical. I'm on here talking about a book I've written about coaching pedagogy and we <laughs> openly admitted that my <laughs> preferred topic is you know, the relationships. But it's, it's good because I think there's one thing we will, I do want to get on to near the end is how the two sort of link and sort of they can be used together, which is quite cool. But yeah, so I think that's sort of something that I almost think you could be, you could almost not have the skills to develop someone as a performer, but if you can build a relationship and get on with them, you'll probably get a lot more out of them than someone who can develop as a performer, but doesn't have the relationship. It's incredible. I really like that. It's a holistic view, really, of players and how a relationship... Because I even remember when I was younger at 
11, 11 or 12 years old playing for Northampton town. And I had a really good coach, a coach who I really liked. You know, you just feel good around people. Mm -hmm. And then I find myself with a coach that I didn't like and my performances drastically dropped. I didn't feel Mm -hmm. like I ever liked the guy. I don't feel like he ever liked me. And then I'm not saying that I should be pro and it's not because of him, but it was definitely an effect on me in, in that relationship, in that being comfortable in that environment that, that's something that stuck with me forever and something you, you really touch on there of having this relationship, this positive environment that you can empower your players and, and really connect with them in a valuable way. Yeah, I think it's a big thing big thing for boys as well, from what I've noticed. And I know there's a little bit of research around it in terms of, I think boys are far more responsive to the teacher or educator as opposed to girls, whereas I think girls are a bit more focused on the topic at hand, since they're in a school setting, boys will decide whether they like a lesson or not based on who teaches the lesson, regardless of what the lesson is on. Whereas girls <laughs> will base it more on, okay, well, I like the topic, even if the teacher and I don't quite get along. Whereas wow. boys are, yeah, so boys are a bit more actually, well, if I get, get along with the teacher, and I think the teacher likes me, they're far more likely to enjoy the lesson and sort of get involved. And I think that sort of, feeds off into sport then with boys who especially if they like the coach they'll feel a lot better and get a lot more out of it so let's jump into the idea of constraints and and the constraints led approach for for coaching and for really for i guess for anything outside of soccer but we're saying in the realm mm. of soccer right now so what are kind of talk a little bit about why you got into the idea of of constraints and and getting into the topic of the book too of of why constraints or what they are really and why they, they can be so valuable? Yeah, so, so it's my interest in constraints that are perfect. My lecturer, Will, who again will love the fact that I've dropped his name in there. But <laughs> he's, for anyone who's read about the sort of constraints and approach recently, or probably his name will probably ring a bell somewhere because he's been involved in writing textbooks and things like that for it. He was the one who taught me about it at undergraduate level. And it sort of sparked my interest a bit because he's like he's very passionate about it, so it sort of rubbed off a little bit on me. And it just sort of something that when you just sort of learn about it, you sort of go, oh, oh yeah, of course. You know why? How come I haven't thought of that already? You know, almost like a light bulb going off somewhere. And I think this, I thought that sort of got me interested in the constraint-led approach as a whole. But I think it's more about my interest in sort of pedagogy and how people learn that sort of I don't know I think it's very easy to get very passionate about it and also very like angry when you see things you don't like <laughs> so then with constraints that approaches you it's really about setting an environment for the players is that am I reading that right are we saying that we're using the activity to to create or setting the environment to challenge the players in a way that it doesn't necessarily need the coach to coach as much is that Am I on, am I on a right line along that? Sort of. So essentially, the constraints led approach suggests that we'll call them learners because that's essentially what we're looking at is how people learn. It says that learners are capable of self organising, which means they can solve their own problems. They don't need someone to tell them, "Here's the solution to the problem I've set." And I think that's one of the things that's very common in football coaching, especially. I don't know so much about other sports, but it's very much the idea of here is a perfect model of a skill. I, as the coach, will show you the perfect model of a skill. And then you, as the learner, need to replicate it. And until you replicate it to the standard I'm happy with, you haven't mastered it yet. You haven't got it. Whereas actually a constraint-led approach would say that as learners we're all capable of finding our own solutions to different problems therefore the coach's job or what some people call it the learning facilitator their job revolves around creating the problem in the environment for the participants to solve and it's that solution is the aim of the session if you get what i mean it sort of goes back in a loop but it's it's one of those ones where i think the language is very can be misleading because when you say learning facilitator what some people will define as facilitator will be different to someone else's and I think it's this subjective language which causes a bit of difficulty 
like I know there's some talk about the learning facilitator challenging the whole paradigm of what the coach's role is and how they are there. You've always got one extreme where the coach just designs the practice and lets the players get on with it and the learners come up with their own solutions to the problem set and the coach is very much sort of hands off. But I think it's, I think you've got to sort of find like a happy medium in the middle where, okay, you've designed a practice to create a problem, but then there's nothing wrong with helping the learners with their solution. So if you're doing a session and you can see someone in one of the learners is trying to produce a movement solution, there's nothing wrong with a coach stepping in and assisting that process. But it's a difficult balance between their solution to fit what the coach likes and actually just trying to make the learner's solution more efficient. And so then if I think about my own experience and my own pathway of coaching, working with a group of players, we're trying to, I don't know, attack, attack through the wings and it doesn't work after five or 10 minutes, perhaps. So then becomes the typical coaching approach of stop and freeze perhaps and say, Mm -hmm. if you play here to here to there, now we can play into the wing. So that would be me showing them the solution. That would be me kind of creating the problem and then also giving them the answer. And then Mm -hmm. I look at, so that's a, a very common way that I see coaching. That's a, that's a very common um, coaching school approach, I guess I would say, a very typical style of coaching. Then I look at a new way, or as I kind of call it new, but revolutionary really with U.S. soccer here that we go through this process of creating the environment, whether it's a small-sided game, then you work with the opponent. So if I want my wingers to have success, I want to attack through the width then my actual start of the session is to set up the game, whatever the game looks like, and then coach the defenders to make it really difficult for the wingers to have success in the game. Then as the wingers begin to fail, then I begin to switch from coaching the defenders and stopping the wingers to then switching sides in the practice to helping the attackers to break down the, the basically the problem that I've created on the other side of the field. Now, are you familiar with that? Am I on the right? We're talking about constraints. I don't want to get into the idea that we have to stop and freeze and coach all the time because I, I think that's antiquated. But the idea of setting it up on the other side as well. So not just working with actually solving the problem, but actually compounding the problem and making it even more difficult. I get what you're saying. My only my comment on that would be because you've I presume by that when you're coaching the defenders in that instance to begin with, you are there for the problem you are setting for the attackers by coaching the defenders is a problem you've already thought about. Is that right? Yes. Okay. That's where I might question a little bit. Just because I would, if I were to do something similar, I might sort of flip flop a little bit more. If you get going okay. from one side to the other, so almost leave it for the first couple of minutes just to see what emerges, and then if you think, okay, well the wingers are having loads of success, even though I want the wingers to have success, I think we could make it harder for them by coaching the defenders to produce a different problem. You could then do that, but then I'd be more tempted to go back and forth between both the team out of possession and in possession just to try to get them to come up with different problems for the other one to try to solve. And you could do, you know, you could do that by open like ask, asking open questions of the group and stuff like that and seeing if because I always get it, as you might for other coaches get it as well, where like some players try to be clever by making a joke. When I ask an open question, sometimes I love it because actually they'll make a joke they think is being funny or sarcastic. And actually I go, oh, I didn't think of that. There's actually something in that that might be interesting. <laughs> you know, and because I haven't thought of it, it's an, it'll be an interesting way. So if you take, in that instance, defenders, they might come up with a way to stop the wingers. It might be actually... We're going to have all backs go out wide to deal with the wingers, and we're actually all, all we're actually going to send our centre back out wide as well, 
even though we'll leave loads of space in the middle, but we're going to do that to try to create a different problem for the attackers. Now, as a coach, you probably wouldn't set that yourself, but it would pr produce, well, not produce, it would invite the attackers to have to problem solve to deal with it. Yeah. So by doing it in a more sort of open way, by sort of letting things emerge a bit more, you'll probably get more problems that need solutions and then there'll be more learning and it will seem like a sort of richer environment albeit it's one where it, it will depend a bit on your players as to how far they'll take it you know and how realistic it could get you know but it'd be something you know almost going back and forth between the attackers and the defenders and seeing if they can produce problems for the other one to solve all the time which is what would happen in a game so what are you, um, some of the common constraints, some of the things that I'm, I'm familiar with as a, as a coach and things that you hear about all the time would be things like uh, amount of passes before you can score a goal or even constraints on field dimensions, things like that, goal setup. So do you have um, kind of some, some key things or some big takeaways you think that coaches should, should really learn about or things that they should maybe think twice about using when they're setting up their practices or planning their practices? Mm. Yeah, so I suppose the biggest takeaway to get, if you, you know, don't want to listen to any more of this podcast, which I hope you don't, <laughs> but is the idea that the constraints-led approach is a framework which behaviour can be viewed, explained, and changed. It isn't one method of coaching. So TGFU, for example, Teaching Games for Understanding, is one method of coaching because only certain things fit underneath it. Whereas a constraints-led approach as a framework is more of an umbrella which helps the coach understand what's going on and can adjust things to try to elicit different movements and behaviours. So there's less about, almost less about what is good or bad. Because it's a framework, there isn't good or bad. There's just better ways or more successful ways in implementing it than others. And I suppose one of the big things with the constraints is I think people get a bit nervous about them because they know there's theory behind it. They don't want to do them wrong or they just dismiss them anyway because they don't, they don't think it ties in with what they're doing. Because you can have really simple ones like you mentioned about the pitch dimensions where you just adjust them. And by adjusting the pitch dimensions, that in itself is a constraint because you are creating different affordances within the environment, which then the participants have to sort of self-organize and problem solve. And it's one of the things I've come across lately because the pitch I'm training on currently hasn't got goals put up because in, in Wales, we're not allowed to play friendlies yet because of COVID. There's no goal post, but there are pitch markings. So you've got the penalty area and you've got the halfway line and all of that but there's no goals. So we've had to improvise and adapt our own sessions in that. And by doing that, we've used different equipment for the goals. And it's really interesting to see how the different equipment affects what the players do without even saying anything or mentioning it at all. So it's a good test. I encourage all coaches to try it out just to see a simple way of how by constraining the equipment in the, in the environment, you elicit different movement solutions. So what I'd say is, when we did it, we've used cones for goalposts. When it comes to shooting, if you've got cones, because they're very low to the ground, nearly all the shots taken in the session were very low because that's where they saw the goals. We've used poles, which are the opposite, which are like five foot tall, quite big, and everyone shoots up because that's where they see the goals. We've used like the mini goals, the pop-up mini goals, very good for like little kids and stuff like that. Yep. We do them if the goals are small. All the players, they try to dribble into the goal. They try to get as close as they can to the goal. So they don't actually shoot at all. They're just passing it in. Whereas as soon as the goals get bigger, they're shooting from distance. They're taking long shots. They shoot from different angles. And that's just an example where you constrain something in the environment and without mentioning anything, behaviours have naturally emerged 
because of what they perceive in their environment. And it's a, it's a quite, you know, it's a great thing. It's really easy for coaches to do. You know, I think it'd be a really cool thing if coaches did try it and they wanted to play around with stuff like that. Because it's, good, it's a, just a really good way to see how much behaviour can change without a coach demanding they do something. And also, I think you know, sometimes when you get coaches that get very angry in a session, you, I often hear coaches, and I've done it before, where you sort of look at your players and you go, oh, you need to try harder, you need to work more to get the outcome I want. And it's actually like, well, it might not be the outcome you want, but if if you're doing a shooting session and you've got posts, you haven't got posts and you're using cones instead, well, then you have to accept, okay, well, all the shots are going to be in a certain place because that's what's in the environment. And it's only, you know, it's just very subtle things like that that can really affect the entire session. And often, you know, it's left me before, like, scratching my head and getting quite annoyed when I'm not seeing what I expected to see. So you just made so many incredible points. Selfishly, for me in my own environment, the way I think about challenging my players and setting up mini goals as target goals and the idea of it being for working on distribution and counterattacking and using them as targets, but the players still use them as real goals that they, as you said, get close to and smash the ball in as hard as they can and try and knock them over, try and smack them into next week. And then Mm. I look at even just observing as a coach, so observing the behaviors of players. And that's something that I talk about a lot and I try and do as much as I can. I try and be as quiet as I can. I try and watch and see if what I planned is coming out, is coming to fruition. But then also understanding just the small nuances like that, using small cones and even thinking back to being a kid and playing when you use jumpers for goalposts, if the ball exactly. was over, over, over waist height, over shoulder height, it was an argument. Did it go in? Did it not go in? Was it a goal? Was it not? So then you always shoot low. So then why would that be any different now, right? We've got small goals. So then mm-hmm. I think about, I get onto the field last night and there were eight groups out there training and everybody runs for the lockup, grab whatever goals they can, grab the big goals, grab the big nets and... Then I'm thinking, well, now based on this conversation, did they know what they were trying to achieve with that? Did they know what they were actually trying to work on? Or, or did you just end up with a small goal because you were the last one in the lockup and that's what you ended up with for your session? And now perhaps your session looks a little bit different. And so the big picture for me really is that constraints, people think perhaps a constraint needs to be some um, like specific little nuance that you've added or some sort of rule that you've added to the game. But really... The constraint is, as you said, two small cones as a goal changes the behavior of the entire practice. Absolutely. I mean, there's obviously, I suppose one of the things you touched on the sort of is one of the constraints I see quite a lot, or like not such a constraint, but in addition, is the idea of like five passes before shooting. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I get, you know, I've been in sessions where as an assistant coach or the lead coach has said it, and I get it because, you know, it is frustrating when you, you've got a group of players and you want them to play a game that looks like the real thing that you see on TV. And all that actually happens is the two guys in your team who can dribble really well, dribble through players and score a goal. And you think, oh, no, this doesn't look like what I want. Therefore, you have the rule that you have to make five passes before shooting and that's the end of it. And what tends to happen is the players who figure out this, they go near their their own sort of defensive corner or their own goal. (laughs) They call their mate over, who's quite good as well. They do five passes over the course of 10 centimetres. Then they go back to dribbling. (laughs) Or you get the poor guy who has played through on goal on pass number three and then has to turn back and look for his mate to make it number four and then look for someone else before it goes to five. <laughs> and it's one of, and it's like and it's one of the things we discussed, discussed is like the idea of fidelity, which essentially means like transference. It is of how much do you do in your practice environment transfers to the performance environment. 
I guarantee you, if you ask all the coaches who put in the rule five passes before shooting, if you said to them, on a match day, if your player gets played through a goal, do you want him or her to stop and pass backwards and slow the attack down, or do you want them to shoot? I guarantee you 99.9% of them will say, no, I want them to shoot. And it's like, great. So when do you practice, and he got played through on goal after three passes, why did you let him shoot then? So that's, that's an example of what we sort of call constraining to constrain rather than constraining to afford. Because affording is trying to get people to find movement solutions that are representative to the performance environment. Whereas constraining to constrain actually sort of, it gets in the way of our sort of natural urge to problem solve and self-organize. So if you go back to that example, when the kid is played through, our adult is played through, their natural instinct to self-organize is, I'm going to shoot, but I'm through, and that's what we do. Yet they have to go against all of that to pass it to someone else. Not to mention the defenders in this game who have stood like they're waiting for a bus for the first four passes and have suddenly <laughs> sprung into life on pass number five because they know, right, now we're in it, now we're in, because they have to they have to try and attack now. And the same thing goes for have you done like the two touch rule? Yeah, I've heard of all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, which is Again, it's an idea where if if you want your team to play like Guardiola's team or like just a possession-based game where players don't take many touches on the ball and there's lots of passes, which I get, you know, I understand that that's a, a nice idea and it looks like aesthetically, it does look very nice. Until you play the game and you take a touch and there's acres of space in front of you and, you know, you only got one more touch before someone else gets the ball. And you've got to pass it on. In the same way, when you're defending, you, when you're defending normally in the game, the attacker is producing problems for you to solve and it's vice versa and there's loads of stuff going on. Whereas in that instance with a two-touch crawl, if you're the defender, as soon as the attacker takes their first touch, the problem is solved for you because you know the attacker can either pass or shoot with his next touch or her touch. And therefore, you know... If you're not near the goal, it has to be a pass. So all you've got to do is look for the easiest passing option and try to cut that out, which again isn't isn't what you would do in a game. So you've got instances where you are constraining, but you're constraining to constrain rather than constraining to afford because the solutions the players or the learners are producing in the practice environment don't transfer into the performance environment, which often leads to a lot of sort of frustration and anxiety from the coaches in the performance environment because they're not seeing what they want, but ultimately it's a horrible feeling when something isn't going your way, but you don't quite understand why it's not going that way. After this quick commercial, join Ben and I as we talk about really getting into the weeds of constraints and then also individual challenges. So what about counter to that then? So the idea of um, thinking about, for example, one-touch finishes, they're very mm-hmm. similar to the idea of number of touches and number of passes. What if it was, um, it's a one-touch finish is worth two goals or a regular finish is worth one or if you make five passes, the goal is worth two goals. Or if you're through on goal on the third pass and you've, you've, you've shot, but you haven't made five passes, it's only worth one goal. What about kind of counter to that? Or are we getting too far into the weeds of, of trying to make these sorts of constraints happen? Yeah, I think it's a very good point. I think it's a very delicate balance between forcing a behavior to emerge rather than letting it emerge naturally. So the one-touch finisher, I know there's a lot of stuff on that because, obviously, if you look at the amount of goals scored, a lot of them are one-touch finishes and a lot of them are in certain areas of the goal or certain areas of the penalty box. And you think, OK. But then the way I'd look at that is, you flip it, as to why are they one-touch finishes? You know, they're often one-touch finishes because 
if you shoot from outside the box, chances are the goalkeeper will save it. And they'll probably save it because most sort of elite level keepers, which is again one of the problems we have in football, where we take a lot of our sort of knowledge and discourse around what the football looks like from the elite level, which again is fine because obviously, you know, grassroots teams can't invest in the amount of performance analyst equipment of academies or professional clubs, which is so, yeah, it's completely understandable. So then you think, okay, well, if you're less likely to score from outside the box, teams try to work their way into the box. And with the way teams defend, they defend very narrow because they know crossing is relatively inefficient. And they know, actually, we can defend crosses easier because they're more predictable than central attacks, looking at combination play and stuff like that. So therefore, you're automatically, you're going to have more shots taken from inside the penalty area. Then you've got to factor in, well, again, with the way things are going, with the amount of crosses coming in, because teams to defend narrow, lots of the shots end up coming from central areas anyway, because it's the best place to score a goal from. You know, no one... You know, if you want if you want an easy chance to score a goal, you go in the middle of the goal, <laughs> relatively close to the goal, but not too close to the goal because then the keeper looks huge. You go a little bit further back, and then you look okay. Well, if this teams are defending narrow and you've got lots of crosses coming in, then the attackers can't take more than one touch. You know, I'm sure if you said to like Lewandowski and like loads of top strikers, would you like to take two touches in the penalty area? They'd be like, yeah, I'd love to. But I can't because there's two defenders next to me. You know, they're both six foot three. And if they get close to me, they're probably going to win the ball off me. So therefore, the attackers, they're not afforded the opportunity to take more than one touch. Yeah. So, they, it, so they inevitably have to take a lot of shots first time, which inevitably leads to lots of goals being scored on the first touch. So it's a, it's a delicate one to do because if you force first time finishing, you remove a possible solution for the attackers as soon as they take attack. Yeah. So there's, some, there's definitely something to be said for, as, as you were mentioning, in regards to trying to elicit a movement solution by sort of encouraging it by a point scoring system because that, in a way, is manipulating the task to try to encourage a behaviour, you know, and it's something that I do mention in the book, you know, or might do, it might be a thing where if you're looking at, say, high pressing, it might be if you win the ball from a high press and that leads to a goal, that's worth three. If you score normally, you still get a goal because you've scored a goal. Yeah. But because I want you to press high because then it gives me as a coach the opportunity to actually coach high pressing, then yeah, why why not add a rule in there? There's a bigger reward and a bigger incentive for them to press high. And it's fine. As long as you've still got the reward for scoring a normal goal, I I have no problem with that whatsoever. And so then, and that kind of goes full circle to my idea of, are we getting too far in the weeds when I'm setting all of these different rules or goal balances when really we can say, go play and then, my my task with the defenders is to make it difficult to score on a one touch, make it difficult mm-hmm. centrally, force them force them away from goal or what have you, so that without even really needing to announce that a one touch finish is is worth the amount of goals, we can control the environment by the way our players are playing it. Exactly. Yeah. If it's like if you watch football and a cross comes into the box and the striker has time to take the ball down pick his spot and finish, you're immediately questioning where the defenders are. Yeah. Because something must have gone wrong. That shouldn't be allowed to happen. So, yeah, I completely agree. If if you can coach defenders to be, you know, aggressive and tight to the attackers and try to win the ball as quickly as possible because it's really close to the goal, then, yeah, you're completely right. By sort of almost without saying it, the attackers will problem solve that actually they have to finish quickly it might not always be first time but it might be they control it on their chest and hit it on the volley straight away as opposed to control on the chest letting it bounce controlling it and then shooting 
Right. So yeah, so I think yeah, so I think it's you're completely right. If you can coach one side or the other, you will elicit some sort of change in behaviour. Yes. So let me ask you then about the individual. Do you share a little on the idea of constraining an individual or maybe not so much constraining, but the idea of, I think of constraining sometimes as making them do things, but the idea that we can challenge them to to behave in a certain way. And I read this uh, recently about um, Ollie Watkins, who is now in the Premier League. Um, And so how he was a wide player with speed and he would often find himself just waiting the game out, waiting for the ball to come for him, waiting, waiting so that once he got the ball, he could do something with it. And so his manager at the time gave him a challenge within the game. And the challenge ultimately was to get him more involved in the game, which improved his performance, but they weren't necessarily important to his position. So he challenged him as a number 11, as a wide forward to win five headers in a game. And the idea was that the headers would be to bring him into the game and not necessarily that his position required him to win headers. And then it was to make five interceptions and a couple of different challenges for him as an individual in the game with the purpose of bringing him into the game more than him being a spectator on the sideline, kind of waiting for the ball to come to him, waiting for the game to come to him. So have you ran into that sort of thing? Um, I saw you kind of frown there as I'm talking about the the experience. And this is, it sounds very old school English football, really, doesn't it? And to, to go by what you said about the comments that players will make, uh, the first game he challenged him, Ollie Watkins had uh, the guy who took kickoff, his striker, flick the ball in the air for him so he could head it down. <laughs> so that was one of his headers straight away. And so yeah. while he kind of took it as tongue in cheek, it improved his performance vastly. So I just wonder, you ran across that? Anything that you've uh, experienced on terms of kind of individual constraints? Yeah, I think that's really, I think that's a great example of him flicking the ball up to head it back. That's <laughs> but that's, that's just a really good example of learners self-organizing to find a solution because his problem was he had to head the ball five times and his solution was okay well from kickoff we've got the ball to begin with <laughs> therefore he does that and i'm sure if he was a center back when the goalkeeper had the ball he might have gone to the goalkeeper and say, oh, trip it up to me i'll head it to you and you catch it and that would be one. one yeah <laughs> yeah exactly but that's a great example and sometimes i love that in coaching when you know, you'll spend an hour planning a small-sided game and then one kid just sees right through, almost like a loophole, yeah. and then all your hard work is done. And you're like, oh. But this, that's just them sort of self-organising, finding a solution to the problem. I think the idea of individual sort of conditions and challenges, which I would, I would call that, I wouldn't necessarily go too deep into constraints there, only because... Within the constraint-led approach, there's a model that says that you can that you constrain either the task, which is the activity, the organism, which is the individual or the learner, and the environment. My only concern with challenging players individually like that, which is probably why you saw me frown, <laughs> was you often get challenges are set for one player, not based on what the opposition will not based on a problem which the opposition will sort of produce, but it is based on, again, something the coach wants to see, which sort of is going into the idea, going back to the old school approach of the coach setting the perfect model of a skill for the players to replicate. What would have been interesting to know with the Ollie Watkins one, if his challenge is heading, if the team had worked on, say, getting crosses in from one wing to Ollie Watkins' wing on the other side and, say, the wingers on the other side of the pitch had the challenge of, you know, can 70% of your crosses be accurate? You know, so they've got a challenge on crossing, which is related to Ollie Watkins' challenge of heading the ball. And that could be based on something they've seen or know from the opposition that they might be weak dealing with crosses, or they might have a fullback who's very small where they thought Ollie Watkins could exploit. But even with that, I think it's a, it's a fine line between 
setting them a challenge based on what the opposition is setting them and a challenge for just the coach to set for them so it looks like they're doing more or looks like or that what they think will improve them more. I think it's a very fine line. I think it can work if all the challenges are connected in the sense with crossing and heading, whereas if it's just heading alone, I struggle to see the relevance of it because like Ollie Watkins said, he just finds a loophole of actually, well, I'll just go to the guy who takes the kick off. <laughs> and like, and I know because I've seen him play for Brentford and now at Villa, he doesn't do that anymore. Right. So his coach created him a problem and the solution he produced with all the to his mate who took the kick off to head back to him isn't a solution which he has then used in other performance environments. So I'd argue with that one, it probably wasn't, the fidelity wasn't there because the skills weren't as transferable. It might have gotten better at heading, but I suppose if one of the five the coach has set is at the kickoff, that's probably, that's no use really. (laughs) And then you might find yourself putting in rules too, right? So you can you have to do five headers, but you can't do it from kickoff. Yeah. Or <laughs> and all of this just screams to me that it's a coach with the best intentions that either has overthought it. And I, I going through coaching school, you take an hour's lunch, and in the entire hour of lunch, coaches are moving. Everyone talks about this, but moving salt and pepper shakers around and moving glassware and knives and forks to replicate formations or moments of a game. And what would you do? And what would you do? And what about this? And what about that? And it's just an environment where coaches overthink and they, it's almost like they try so hard to create the perfect environment that they've almost gone the opposite end of the scale where it's become somewhat unrealistic at times. Yeah. Everybody tries so hard. Yeah, I think it's, again, it's diff- it's so difficult with coaching because everyone who gets involved in coaching is doing it for a good purpose. You know, coaching is a difficult job. You've got to try to please the players, their family, all, all the rest of the stuff going on, along with, and I think we only coach to admit it, there's a part of you that does take it personally when things go wrong. And by that same token, there's a part of you that sort of wants to take credit when things go well. You know, I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. If, you've, if, you, if you as a coach have designed sessions that you like and you believe are best for the learners in your environment and you deliver them and you feel they've gone well and then your team does well and it's the sort of things you want to see, then great, yeah. There's, I know, there's nothing wrong with sort of, you know, saying to yourself in the car right home, you know what, I've done really well lately. You know, I'm doing a great job. You know, I think that's fine. I think it's just sometimes I think it's almost too easy to sort of really crave like our team playing at like the elite level. And we want to improve everyone so much and we want to do things so much. And I think that's where that's how sort of football ended up in the sort of model of coaching where everything is so broken down, it doesn't resemble the game. And then it's almost taken a while for players doing loads and loads of skills that have been broken down beyond recognition for us to realise, actually, this doesn't look like football anymore. <laughs> and then when we put players into a game, they're not doing what we wanted them to do. And then we've sort of gone, actually, well, it can't be the game that's wrong because the game is the game. That's what we started with. And then you look back at the other drills and you think, ah, they must be what was a bit wrong that must be what was the issue you know when you've got players passing you know to someone unopposed who's just stood right in front of them (laughs) because we think that's what the basics is and it's like yeah okay I get why because if you feel they haven't got the ability to control a football or pass a football I get why that could be you could see the use of it but like so for instance I was in a school today and obviously it's a very difficult time because of covid and the lockdown on top of the summer holidays and the school's in a deprived area so there's lots of kids who haven't played sport or especially organized sport for four or five months so i get the sort of 
the wants to bring it back to what was known as the basics. And they did this pass intro where someone, where the coach said, you control the ball on the inside of your foot and you pass it with the inside of your foot and then you, you know, walk to the next cone and you do it slowly to start with and you're going to build it up. And they did that and the coach was like, yeah, you guys, your passing's come along really nicely. And then the coach was like, all right, I'll let you play a game. They played a game. And two minutes into the game, the coach was why is no one passing the ball? <laughs> and, and you can see the players are basically in their face is this like, well, we don't know how to. I know we did the bit, with the passing we just did, but I don't know how, you know, I don't know how to find space. I don't know how to make decisions. It's like, it's a real problem in, in football and that's with other sports as well. Like, football is incredibly difficult. I know it's, I know it's very trendy to say, oh, it's a simple game, you know, made complicated <laughs> and all the rest. It's like, it's not. It is... For one person, when they've got the ball, they've got to decide if they want to pass, shoot, dribble, run with the ball, hold on to the ball. And while they're trying to make this decision, 21 players around them are all moving around. So even though if they think, well, for one second, oh, I'm going to pass it over there, you know, to my mate on the left, someone stops that option. And then you've either got to think, oh, do I still do it anyway? Or do I make a different decision and go somewhere else? And then you've got your mate off the ball on the left wing who's thinking all right, am I in space? Do I need to find space? As soon as they move to go into space, an opposition player moves because they've seen the space as well. And it's like, you've got 22 players all thinking individually, all trying to somehow coordinate their movements together. It's yeah. incredibly difficult. But we feel that it's, it's too easy to sort of make a linear approach where we oversimplify and break down sort of normal movements to the extent where they're not relevant anymore. They don't resemble the game at all. And then we get frustrated as coaches when the, the aspect of the game we were thought we were working on, we weren't really working on it. You know, and then it's always when our, where coaches will do it, will, they'll do an act, a drill or an activity that doesn't really resemble the game. They'll then go into the game and it doesn't look right because the game is messy and chaotic and beautiful. And then they think, oh, well, what we need to do is do more of these basic drills because then, then they'll understand the game. And then they get players who are very, very good at doing basic drills that don't resemble the game. And they're still not better at the game. And then we sort of lose our way a little bit and think, actually, surely something's going wrong here, if you get what I mean. Yeah, I do. And I hear very commonly, we struggle to connect to the weekend. We failed to pass the ball well in the game in the weekend. So we isolate and we pass through cones or in some sort of little activity that, again, doesn't look like the game. So it doesn't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. Yeah. And I suppose it's one of the things, there's a bit in the book where I talk about unopposed versus opposed, which is a big, big debate on a coaching community. And it's a difficult one because basically if you follow the constraints-led approach, unopposed practices don't have enough relevant information in the environment for the learners to learn because it's not, it's not realistic to football, even though, and it's one of those things, it's so difficult because I know coaches at the elite level swear by unopposed practices. And that's always a big sticking point because there's so much survivorship bias and nonsense <laughs> where we think, oh, well, they do it. You know, Antonio Conte runs the unopposed drills all the time and his teams are brilliant to watch. And it's like, okay, but their aim isn't the learning to occur. Their aim is just, we want to win on the weekend. And therefore, this is what we're going to do. Because the constraints that approach argues that for learning to take place, perception action has to be present and it has to be relevant. And what by perception action is basically what we perceive and what we can see and hear and sense and pick up everywhere, that then informs what decision we make. So the best example is like what we were talking about. If you're trying to pass to someone and there's an opposition player, you've got to take into consideration what the opposition player is doing, where are they moving, are they trying to press you with the ball or cut out the pass to your teammate. You've then got to try to work out 
the possible solutions based on the opposition with the possible solutions that you think your teammate is doing. Are they coming true? Are they trying to run into the space? You know, which side do they want the ball passed to them? You know, do they actually, are they trying to drag the defender away for you to run with the ball? And there's so much stuff going on there, which in a game looks very simple. You know, if you've got the ball and your teammate runs away, the defender runs with them and you just progress the ball 10 yards. For a spectator, it looks very simple. Whereas actually there's loads of decisions that have gone into that one part of the game that will probably never be spoken about. So there's a lot, a lot around that and this idea that for learning to take place, there has to be enough relevant information with opposition goals, some sort of pressure, ideally, obviously not too much depending on the environment, but some sort of pressure, you know, for learning to actually take place. You know, there should be a consequence if you make a mistake. You know, whereas actually if you do unopposed work, it is largely down to the coach demanding intensity. And that's not the player's not being intense it's the players have figured out straight away their solution to this problem is actually we can walk it we don't need to like you know i love it when i see coaches do unopposed work and the coach is saying come on demand the ball call for it it's like why it's like no one else is going to have to yeah he can just (laughs) he can stand there say absolutely nothing he knows the ball is coming to him because that's the exact unopposed practice you just told them to do so he's just going to stand there, wait for the ball to come to him or her, and they're going to control it and pass it where you told them to pass it, and you're going to say, well, then. And it's like, well, no, but as soon as you put them into a game, then there's the opportunity, if they don't call for the ball, you could then say, look, if you're not getting the ball, then you've got to call for it. You've got to communicate with each other to get on the ball. <laughs> the, and this whole conversation just conjures up a picture of a coach <laughs> frustrated and thinking <laughs> why what do i have to do i've taught you passing why isn't it working i taught mm. you to demand the ball why isn't it working yeah. so for people interested in this the constraints that approach how do we how do we find out about your book ben how do we uh, get in contact with you and i guess really just explore this even further mm. so yes yeah, so you can get in contact with me in lots of ways so i'm on twitter i'm very active on twitter if you look up on Twitter, at BenBell98, that's my Twitter. My photo is the book cover photo as well, so it's all there. I'm on Instagram as well, if people are fond of Instagram. I don't post many things on Instagram. However, I am often on my phone on Instagram, so if you want to drop me a message about something, that's all good as well. So my Instagram is Ben underscore Bell underscore coaching. The book is on Amazon. It's on with the publishers as well. It's titled Introduction to the Constraints-Led Approach, Application in Football. And I suppose it is, it's great for any coaches who are looking for sort of theoretically underpinned practices. And by that, I mean, I know there's loads of books out there that have lots of practices in them. You could buy a book on Guardiola's practices. But then I think that will often lead you into a situation where you are the frustrated coach again, because you're doing Guardiola's practices with your under eights and then not playing like Guardiola's teams. And you don't know why, because the books, they don't explain the theory behind practices. So my book, there's theory chapters. Please don't get put off by the theory chapters. They're not very long. It's just an overview of the theory rather than a textbook. And there are over 40 practices designed with the constraints-led approach across all different topics, in possession, out of possession, transitions, all showing you how the constraints that approach can be applied in practice. And I suppose one thing slightly hypocritical of me is that I'd say you don't always have to use it, even if you love it. Like I've written a book on it and I don't use them all the time. You know, you don't, it's not, you don't have to swear by it. You know, it's not, that's not the Bible. You don't have to go berserk about it. You know, for instance, with my lot, who I'm coaching, they're, you know, they're the best lads ever. And they love an unopposed shooting practice. They love it. They love it when there's a target player and they pass it to them and they tell them left or right 
and then they may pass it to them and then they can hit it at a keeper and he might go in the top corner and then they'll be off celebrating and you know they love it and even though I know from a learning perspective it's not doing them any good because I know them as people and as learners and we've got that relationship I sort of you sort of factor it actually before the game if they want to do an unopposed shooting practice that fine you know I've got no yeah. problem with it but because I know the theory, I know not to expect them to be amazing at shooting because of this unopposed shooting practice. <laughs> you know, I know they're doing it because I've let them do it and they like doing it because they like shooting because they're kids and kids want to shoot because they're far more basic than we give them credit for. And actually, that's fine because, you know, you, even though the constraints that approach and all the theory that I've spoken about goes against it, I'm happy to do it because from a relationship point of view, you know, it could be really good. And I suppose that's one of the biggest things with coaching is because it's so complex. Yes, you've got the theory which we've really delved into, which has been amazing. You know, you've got all this theoretical pedagogy about linear and non-linear approaches and all these excellent stuff you can look at from like, open questioning which we've spoken about as well and there's loads of stuff out there that's amazing and there's you've also got to factor in these are still people that are playing football you know they've still got feelings they they are still playing because it's fun you know they're still playing because they like playing football and actually if you know as we're saying with the sort of coach athlete relationship it's so important where you know if you want to you know, not relinquish the pedagogy. That's probably the wrong word. But if you want to say, actually, you just want to play a game or you want to do an unopposed shooting thing or you want to do something that you just like to do, then fine, yeah. You know, why not Why not do an unopposed shooting? Why not have, like, the coach join in in a game because it's a good laugh and even, you know, even with no constraints or no method, but just because it's fun and you'll all get along and it'll be a good, a good laugh at the end of it. You know, that's great. You know, I see no... I see no problem with going against it. It's just once you understand the theory, you understand your expectations for what you want to see in the future, what you expect to see in the future, based on what you've done. And I think yeah. that's it's you know, it's trying it's so complicated because you're trying to balance so many different things along with your own expectations and your own egos, along with your players' egos and their expectations and the parents' egos and their expectations. And if you're in a possibly an academy setting, you've got the academy's expectations and all of that. <laughs> and it's like, you know, and then you took kids who are like, oh, can we do shoot in? You're like, yeah, go on then. Go on then. <laughs> Man, that's it's awesome. The, even just the, the conversation here of about an hour or so of exploring the the theory, as you said, the idea that it's not just removing things to train them and go back it, as you said it, it has to be relevant it has to be relevant for our players and i think the coaches that are spending one two three sessions a week on the field sometimes four or five hours at most with their players that are trying to maximize and as you said meet all of those expectations and still manage a relationship and still manage to enjoy working with a kid for the a for themselves mm. and then keep the kids engaged and, and having fun so uh, I'm really glad that we had this conversation. I'm really happy to, to be sharing your book out there. So again, everybody at Ben Bell, get on to him. Make sure you pick his brain because I'm sure that there's plenty to say in future too. So Ben, I really appreciate your time. This has been awesome. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. It's been amazing. It's been great chat. If you're like me and have gone through this episode thinking about what else you can do or how you can change or maybe you have done things like the pass counts or the touch counts and really kind of seeing the big picture here in terms of the impact that you were hoping and, and maybe didn't achieve well I encourage you to connect with Ben I encourage you to read the book I encourage you to think about all of the unintended consequences that will come from all sorts of constraints or rules that we put into the games that we're playing that of course come with a good reason and perhaps not always the best understanding so really explore this challenge yourself connect with Ben connect with me and more coming from Heads and Volleys as always real soon